Hello, my name is Mark Gibson, and you're listening to the podcast version of the Chagask Signpost series, a weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. My name is Pat Murphy. Uh, I'm uh, Head of Knowledge Transfer with, with Chagask. Uh, and our webinars are brought to you in conjunction with National Rural Network, Food Drink Ireland, Skillnet, and Dairy Sustainability Ireland. Uh, I'm joined this morning uh, by Catherine Keener from, from Chagas, who's going to help with the questions at the end of the presentation. Catherine, you're very welcome. Morning, Pat. And we're delighted to be joined by Killian Kelly this morning from the Munster Technological University based in, in Tralee. Uh, he's a lecturer there. He's a studied uh, I think as a as a mature student, uh, wildlife biology uh, in uh, Tralee, and as part of that process, uh, it took on a, a project on conservation uh, grazing in in upland habitats, and I think that's led on to you going back as a lecturer into into Tralee and 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 further study in in that area. You're very welcome, Killian. Thank you very much, Pat, and good morning to everyone. Any particular reason why you? ended up in the uplands studying grazing and, and grazing patterns and grazing processes? Uh, well, I suppose during my 20s, I was, I was involved in, in outdoor education, working a lot in the uplands uh, and had a love for the uplands. And when the opportunity arose to work, I suppose, locally in Kerry that I'd, I'd moved to um, and to carry on studies, it, it was just a, a nice fit for me. The, the opportunity came up to do the master's by research in conservation grazing and uh, yeah, I, I went for it, and, and it's been it's been great since. Yeah, and it's a I suppose a, a, a hugely topical issue now in the in the whole management of those upland areas that that we have a grazing management system that uh, manages to to keep and 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 improve the, the those habitats. So I suppose without further ado, I might get you to start your presentation. Uh, sure. And, uh, reminding people to that for questions and answer, for questions, uh, just use the Q and A. And uh, we'll, we'll get to those questions uh, at the end of the presentation. Great. OK, well, thank you, Pat. And thank you to Catherine and to Catherine in particular, I suppose, for uh, inviting me to do this. Um, it's been a while coming and I'm delighted to be here. And good morning to all the listeners. Um, so I'm going to talk about conservation grazing in the uplands, um, starting with this image, which is taken from the Connor Pass in County Kerry looking northwest, I suppose, onto the Mount Brandon range. So I think the middle peak there is Mount Brandon. And, on the far side of that, you've got Massenthumpon, which um, which is a site where there's a, a state-owned nature reserve, and that's where I did my research on the impact of cattle grazing on upland habitats. So more about that in a while. I just wanted to kind of set the scene as to where the, the study happened. Um, to begin with, I'm going to try and click on, uh, just to introduce conservation grazing and what we mean by it. Um, and sort of the types of species that are involved and breeds that are involved. And then maybe just mention upland habitats and species briefly and their, their current conservation status. And that has been very well covered by previous speakers, particularly Katrina Douglas in, in, in episode one. So I won't dwell on that, I'll, I'll, it'll just be a slide or two. And then I'm gonna get into the second half, I suppose, or, uh, or so that will be about the conservation grazing work that I did in Kerry um, a few years ago. So these are Dexter cattle out on the site. So we're on that northern slopes of the mountains that we saw what, what, a few minutes ago. Um, here the cattle are out on a bit of blanket bog at about, I suppose, 450 metres or so thereabouts. This is looking um, back east over Sauce Creek for those that would know the area. OK, so what is conservation grazing then? Well, let's just put a few words around this. It's, it's grazing for the benefit of wildlife conservation and all manner of species and breeds can be involved. You know, it's the use of grazing animals to maintain and enhance biodiversity. Sometimes it might be about preventing some scrub encroachment, keeping the sward open for a particular species, maybe a butterfly, or more generally for habitat improvement or maintenance. So it's a tool really for, for managing habitats, and there are plenty of other tools. It's not the not necessarily the go-to one. I mean, you've got mechanical means and um, pres prescribed burning and um, and so on. So you know. The conservation grazing is, is part of um, a set of tools that we can use to help improve habitats. Um, so it's generally focused on semi-natural landscapes with domestic animals. All sorts of, of habitats have, have had some conservation grazing involvement. I've highlighted the uplands here because it's the one we're going to be talking about. Why might we use conservation grazing? 
a lot of our semi-natural landscapes have developed with some grazing. We have a long history of grazing in the uplands in Ireland. I suppose going back centuries, it would be cattle grazing more, more in more recent decades. Um, sheep grazing became dominant and we're starting to see a little bit of more interest coming back for, for the cattle grazing because they have some, some additional benefits or other benefits for, <clears throat> for wildlife habitats. Um, so some habitats benefit for, from grazing to maintain their open nature. So to keep them grassy or dwarf shrubby, as you might see uh, in some of the images at the bottom, the grazing may be habitat focused generally to try and maintain, say, the conservation status of wet heat, as I'll be talking about in a while, or it may be um, focused on a particular species, a ground nesting bird or a butterfly um, or some, some plants that will need to keep the, <coughs> pardon me, the, the, the sward open. Just to mention in Ireland, generally, if we remove grazing um, for a lot of the countryside, if we were to remove grazing altogether or management altogether, we would get succession to woodland. And that's a, a journey to woodland whereby some shrubs would come in and then maybe some, some trees like birch that are they're good seed setters, they'll come in early and then oak would eventually develop. And so um, without some management, that process will, will, will happen over decades and into centuries, that sort of time scale. Um, and that might be desirable in some scenarios. Um, just to say that from the outset, that often you know, the removal of grazing is what is desired in order to develop um, certain habitat types. But if we're interested in, in maintaining, uh, say, wet heath or, or grassland habitats in a certain condition, then conservation grazing certainly does have a role. Just to mention these images briefly, along the bottom left, we've got some Dexter cattle on a, a site of special scientific interest, a triple SI site in the UK. Europe. <coughs> Pardon me, I've had a little bit of a chesty cough the last few days. Near the Wire Valley in um, the UK. And here these Dexters are, are grazing this triple, S, triple SI site to benefit the habitat for grassland species of uh, plants, grasses, and, um, and invertebrates. In the middle, this is Pollardstown Fen or a site near Pollardstown Fen uh, in Kildare, where these highland cattle were employed to break up the the sward a little bit because it was becoming very thick with grasses. Um, and here the target species was um, marsh tree butterfly, which relies on a plant called Sussia pratensis, uh, devil's bit scabious, which can be overcrowded if the grasses become rank and overgrown. So in that case, the highlands were employed to get in there for a season and, and break it up a little bit. The right hand image on the bottom is from um, a fen, a Wiccan fen, no, not Wiccan, a heat in the UK. Um, Near, near the Wire Valley in Birmingham as well. And here, Longhorn cattle, and I have a picture of them coming up, were used to kind of keep the, the open structure of the habitat. So just a few images here of, of the types of species and locations where you might find conservation type grazing. Um, bottom left is the Wire Forest. So here you might have a little hamlet or some, uh, some farmsteads, and you would have orchards and grasslands that are sites of scientific interest surrounded by woodland. And here the dexters that undergraze the orchards, uh, keep, the, keep it grassy, if you like, and then they might um, walk into the woodland every now and again and graze down some bramble or whatever. Uh, the Hen Harrier Project here is, is one of our own. They're employing cattle in a conservation grazing setting. Um, and they have some excellent videos online, if you'd like to look them up, um, of imagining rushes with some mowing and then some aftermath grazing. Um, and they're doing some nice trials on that. Um, but it's not always cattle. You know, you've got sheep and goats and ponies are involved in conservation grazing as well. So a wide range of species, depending on, on the job, in inverted commas. So site management involves um, selecting appropriate species, um, you know, managing the stocking rates. Sometimes it might be appropriate to do extensive grazing, where you've got small numbers of animals uh, grazed over large areas, and it might be seasonal. In other scenarios, it might be useful to mob graze, so you saw those Dexter cattle on the grassland site in the UK. They were strip grazed, if you like, and they may not return to that strip for a year or more. Um, and that's the idea of mob grazing, where you, you pack animals into a small area, they graze it down, and then you move them off site for whatever the appropriate length of time is. Um, one thing that is kind of key here, and I'll come back to it later in the talk, is you know, really conservation grazing needs to be about, or needs to consider at least the habitat availability and distribution of habitat patches. Stocking rates tend to be a little bit um, blunt, I suppose, if I can say that, uh, in that the animals, if you release 10 animals out onto a site, 
they're not going to spread themselves out nicely like a checkerboard. They use it in a patchy way um, because they're herd animals, they stick together, they'll move around to their preferred habitat patches. So site management really should consider the habitat availability and the distribution of preferred habitat types because the animals will target those. Um, and so you may need to put in incentives, if you like, uh, watering areas or, or mineral licks to get the cattle or sheep, whatever it is, to target specific areas uh, depending on, on the job of interest. All sorts of breeds and species are involved in conservation grazing. I've listed a few here. Um, cattle were, Dexter cattle were the ones that, that I studied, um, but there's all sorts of others that, that would be suitable in a conservation setting. And I suppose one of the things with conservation grazing is that it's not just about conserving habitats and species, wildlife habitats and species. It's also giving these breeds um, a chance because otherwise they, you know, they may not uh, keep up with the, the continental breeds, more productive breeds. So it, uh, it sort of gives them a place in the world and um, is useful from a domestic biodiversity conservation setting as well, or context. So how do they influence habitats? Well, just briefly on this, well, they go in and they, they eat the plant material. So they're selective in their defoliation. That depends on a range of things, the type of animal, the size of the animal, but also the availability of plants, the physical form of the plants, the chemistry of the plants, because some of them have evolved to deter grazers with spikes or chemistry or whatever it is, and some plants in are seasonal. So they're very selective, I suppose is the point here. Um, and some species are more selective than others, and I'll get to that in just a second. They also, of course, poach up the ground by walking through it, by standing around. We've all seen that uh, in our local fields. Um, and that creates little pockets of uh, niches for invertebrates, uh, but it can also be damaging as well if the poaching is very uh, focused on certain areas. And depending on the habitat, you know, the ground may or may not be able to take a lot of poaching if the animals are, are, are grouping together. They obviously influence uh, nutrients as well by dung and urine. So they redistribute nutrients uh, in a habitat by grazing one area, uh, you know, defecating and urinating in others. So they're involved in nutrient dynamics very much so. So all of these things have kind of impacts on habitats, direct impacts, indirect impacts. They, they can influence productivity, distribution of nutrients. Um, they definitely influence the structure of, of habitats and ecosystems. And by that, I mean, like they can influence uh, whether a habitat is very grassy or very shrubby or whether trees invade or not, whether the grass height is short or, um, or tall or short. Um, and over time, very much influences the structure and species composition of habitats with knock-on consequences then for all, uh, a whole range of plant and animal communities within the space. So the invertebrates, the birds, the, the mammals, the predators, they can all be influenced by the impact that grazing animals have on, on habitats. Here I've picked out some sort of extreme examples uh, just to highlight that different animals have different impacts depending on their, their size, how much they need to eat, their preferences, um, and the way in which they, they graze. So the physiological differences uh, it will, will induce different impacts because diff different animals are, are, are uh, selective um, and have the ability to be selective in different ways. So if you think about the rabbit down at the bottom, very small little you know, lips and, and teeth and getting select the, the mouth parts or getting and select um, particular parts of plants. If you're to go on a step further and think about um, invertebrate grazers like caterpillars, they can be really selective on, on the part of the leaf that they're targeting. Whereas the, um, the, the larger animals with larger mouths um, are, are a little bit less selective. And that has impacts uh, on, on the sward characteristics. So, uh, and, then, and then biodiversity. So the sheep, you know, they're very dexterous lips and incisors, they can clip close to the ground. They tend to result in a very short and even sward. Whereas cattle, they're a little bit less selective and they have a different way of grazing. So they end up in a kind of a, a tussocky sward characteristics. Um, so little tufts here and there and short bits and tall bits. And that creates different niches where invertebrates and other plants can, um, can find their space. So I picked out sheep and cattle here uh, because sheep are obviously the dominant uh, species in the, in, the, in the Irish uplands. Cattle were ones are making a, perhaps a little comeback. Um, just a few points on the, on the sheep there on the left-hand side. As, they, as I've said, they can be highly selective. They can select the, the, the parts of the plant that they want, the shoots, the pods, um, the, the flowers, 
because of their, their physical attributes. Cattle, on the other hand, they use their tongues and dental pad when grazing, and they pull up lumps, and they take a step and they pull up lumps. I'm sure uh, many of you out there know a lot more about this than I, but the result on this ward is that it can be patchy, short bits, tall bits, little tussocks, uh, and that can have benefits for um, invertebrate species and birds that maybe use the tussock for nest sites, but like open habitat so they can see predators. Um, yeah. Okay, so the uplands then, I'm going to get into my own project very shortly. I won't dwell on this because it's been well covered by previous speakers, but just to, just to re-emphasize the, you know, the, the beauty of our uplands, uh, first of all, and their importance for, for recreation and uh, a working landscape, um, but also very important for, for wildlife conservation. Um, uh, and biodiversity, lots of uh, lots of annex habitats. Forty percent of SAC network is is in the uplands. Many rare and threatened species. So these are just wonderful places for for biodiversity and for nature. Um, you know our largest expanses of, if you could say, wilderness. And um, this was covered by Katrina Douglas in detail in episode one. I've just put the three main habitats uh, that I studied in bold here. There are a range of what we call Annex 1 habitats that are designated under the Habitats Directive. Um, so wet heath, dry heath and blanket bog are the ones that I focused on. And it's probably fair to say that they cover the majority of the Irish upland. They'd be the dominant habitat types. So that's why we focused on them. These habitats occur in mosaic. So, you know, in the uplands there aren't hard boundaries between one habitat and the next, you know, in terms of hedgerows or, or um, so on. So. Blanket bog will grade into wet heath, and over the space of 50 meters hiking across the mountains, you could incur, you could encounter rather a bit of wet heath and then a bit of blanket bog. And as the, as the slope increases, you might be into some dry heath. So you have them all in, in a sort of general area. This is looking onto Mass and Tampon. Um, so yeah, a lot of the, the work I would have done would have been on the, the slopes of that mountain in the background. Yeah, a lot of rare and threatened species, uh, some of our um, most threatened and iconic flagship type birds like the curlew, the hen harrier, which we'll be familiar with from, um, from the projects that are going on, occur in the uplands. So some, some wonderful species occurring up there and definitely ones that are of conservation interest. Even the, the little meadow, meadow pipit in the middle here that many of you will know, fairly ubiquitous across, across the country, even that bird is in uh, unfavorable conservation status or, or is red listed on the birds of conservation concern. So there's a lot up, th lot up there in the uplands, uh, a lot of beauty and a lot of conservation interest. Um, I picked out this, which are kind of just screen grabs from the Article 17 reports of 2013 and 2019 that would have been produced by the MPWS. Reporting on the status of our upland habitats, um, they're assessed under a range of measures. I wouldn't be trying to read all of these. I'll just give you the, the highlight or the low light rather, which is a, 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 a sad face emoji in that they are not in good conservation status, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, as I said, they're, they're assessed under a range of um, criteria and overall the status for these habitats is, is bad or unfavorable. Um, so getting, I suppose, bringing the, the conservation grazing aspect uh, and the status of, of, of some of our upland habitats, um, there's definitely an interest in, in, in grazing management and um, how it can be used to try and improve habitats. So I'll get on here now to my own work in Kerry. Um, I hope I'm doing, ticking along okay time-wise. So the project, it's been a few years now and it, it, sort of the results are slow in the, uh, in coming out, but it's this sort of timeline was 20, 2013 to 2015. Um, so we got together, and when I say we, it was IT3 at the time, I began my master's by research, um, and we partnered with the National Parks and Wildlife Service, and Paddy Fenton, who's a farmer in West Kerry, who farms Dexter's in Bentry, um, to do some conservation grazing on the site that I mentioned earlier on, uh, Mount Brandon Nature Reserve. So the, the questions were around, well, if we release these animals onto an open mountain, if the site is 460 hectares, where will they go? What habitats will they select? And what will be the impact of their grazing on those habitats? Or indeed, what's the impact of excluding them from certain areas? Um, so the site was grazed with Dexter's. Um, very, uh, top, uh, top image there on the right is very characteristic to the site. This is probably a bit of wet heat in maybe August or so, maybe into September, looking at the Kaluna in flower there. Um, they, we GPS tracked the cattle 
or some of the cattle each season. So this was a three three year project. Um, so different animals were selected each year and fitted with collars. And the collars took a GPS position every two hours for the four months or so the cattle were up there. So this is just some detail on the site. You can see where it is there on the northern, northwestern tip of the Dingle Peninsula. The, the middle bar image kind of shows you the, the, the character of the site. You know, all of these habitats blending into each other, fairly remote. 462 hectare state-owned reserve, dominated really by blanket bog and wet and dry heat, with some grasslands um, occurring in smaller proportions. And I have the, the proportions coming up in a, in a few slides time. And then around the edges, um, you know, you've got scree slopes, the sea cliffs, and there's some river habitats in there as well. So here are the animals out on site. I'll just let that sit for a second. So they're on wet heat or so blanket bog probably on the top left there. I'm having a scratch on one of the images down on the valley floor. So this is a stream that flows through the site. Um, there's wet grassland either side of the river and they tended to uh, enjoy that. And they also enjoyed a bit of sunshine and rainbows as well when um, they had had uh, a good graze. So yeah, we worked with Paddy, we GPS tracked the cattle over three seasons using these collars that we got from a company in Sweden. They're programmed to take position every two hours. And then we can use those data to look at where the cattle went. And if you can combine that with habitat data that were provided by the MPWS, we can look at preferences uh, and habitat selection. So where do the animals go? What do they like to target? Um, and from there, then you can make kind of decisions about you know, what sites would be suitable for, for certain animals. So yes, the analysis of the GPS data, uh, maybe just look at the images first of all. This is a, this is, um, these are the habitats of the, the study site. So there's a scale bar down the bottom there. It's one kilometer across. So it's sort of four or five kilometers across the study site um, on the Northern tip. I'm pointing here as my pointer. I'm not sure if you see it, you probably can't, but, um, you know, on the northern tip there, you've got sea cliffs. And then on the top image, you've got a line that outlines what we call the home range of these cattle. So we can analyze the data, if you like, pencil out the area that the cattle grazed. And if you know the habitats and what proportions those habitats occur in those areas, you can do some analysis on, on preference or avoidance, which is, kind of, um, which is kind of nice to look at. The bottom image just shows some GPS points on the, the habitats. Uh, more about that in a while. And so then when, what we do after, once you've identified where the animals go, we can look at habitat preference and avoidance using various measures. So these are just a couple of results uh, from, the, from the GPS part of the study. Um, these are the kind of distances that the animals traveled on average over the, the three seasons that they were out. The bottom graph shows, um, shows the, whole, the size of the home range. So I'm, I'm saying full year here in the left-hand bar, but really that's that's full season. That's on average, the, the animals traveled about 120, or sorry, used about 120 hectares of the site over the four months that they were out on site. So we've nine samples um, over three years. And on average, they, they took up about 120 hectares out of the 460 available to them. So they don't use it evenly. Um, they use a proportion of it. Um, they use different size home ranges in, in different months, as you can see from the, the other bears on, on the chart. Um, so in different months, and um, they, they range out over, over different parts of the reserve. Here is an image of, of the, uh, well, an outline of the reserve and the different habitats. And there's a key on the left hand side for the different habitats. The, the yellow lines around the outside are what are called uh, minimum convex polygons. Here we, or the program, if you like, that we use just draws an outline of where the animals used, if you like, uh, puts a string around all the dots and that's the maximum home range. But as you can see, it kind of leaves gaps where the animals probably didn't go to. So then there's another type of analysis that we do um, that is a, a tighter fit. So the, the black lines in here our analysis of home range. So we can estimate then that the animals use about 120 hectares on average over the course of the season. But what's interesting uh, for me from a management perspective is they don't use the site evenly. Going back to the idea of stocking rates, you know, they don't just all say, look, you go over here and I'll go over here and we'll all take a hectare each. It's very patchy and they target different areas. Um, so I, I suppose recommendations should be on a site by site basis if possible. And the ability to change stocking rates uh, would be useful from a conservation perspective.
Here, there's GPS locations overlaid on aerial imagery. And um, you can see, again, it's very patchy. Just to highlight a few things um, to the middle. Um, so I'm looking for a pointer here. I'm hoping you can see my, my pointer. Yeah, you we can. can see your pointer perfectly. OK, great. Thanks, Pat. Yeah. So here, just to highlight this line of dots, this is um, the valley floor, and it's very grassy down there. And they targeted this part of the, the, the reserve later in the season, in, in sort of October time, um, when there wasn't as much um, grazing perhaps available for them in, in the other habitat types. It also possibly could have been related to biting insect, insects. The midges are, are less uh, prevalent in, at that time of year. Perhaps the animals moved down to the lower parts of the reserve at that time of year. This line here is kind of interesting because this is the Dingle Way and animals use that part of the reserve to to access uh, different areas, just like we do, I suppose, they, they, they like following the paths. So that has, uh, you know, we have to consider those things if, if implementing grazing on a site. Uh, this patch over here, sometimes, you know, one day we had a group of scouts came barging through, down through the, down through the study site, because it's on the Dingle Way, lots of traffic, and the animals headed out west. And once they did head out west, they kind of stayed there for a few days at a time. This middle clump here, was focused around some old dwellings. There's shelter there and there's a bit of water availability there. We didn't provide any extra water because there's the river and there's also um, uh, some water pools around these dwellings. So that's where the cattle got their, their water. Uh, again, just some images of the site. I'll just let that for a second and I'll click on. Okay, so habitat selection then. Um, maybe just focus here on the left-hand side first. So this is the study area, and this shows the percentage of each habitat type or main habitat type in the reserve. Um, so starting at the bottom, you've got blanket bog and then dry heat and wet grassland and wet heat. And then all of these C08, C93, that should probably be C92, et cetera, et cetera, across the years are different colored animals. So each bar represents one animal over a season and the proportion of each habitat type in that home range that I mentioned earlier. So that outline of the, the subset of the reserve was made up of these habitats and quite consistent across um, each sample. So um, blanket bog making up 25 to 30 percent. And then the next one up is dry heat making up maybe 20, 25 percent. Big proportion there for, for wet heat. So that habitat makes up um, a large area within the animal's home range, but they don't necessarily use these habitats in relation to their availability. So they're sort of very selective. They, in fact, they select out wet grassland and dry heat, even though there's a lot more wet heat available in their space. So that's what we look at next is, do they use these areas in habitats in proportion to their availability? And they don't really. So even though there's a lot of blanket bog available in their space, uh, that they use on a daily basis, they tend to avoid it. And we found in this study, at least, that they, they sort of selected dry heat, even though there was less of it available, and wet grassland. And really wet grassland was what they were after. This is going to be interesting from a conservation perspective if we're thinking about letting animals out onto an area that has a range of habitats, and it's all patchy, as I mentioned earlier. They, you know, they're not going to target, at least they didn't in this study, the more sensitive habitat, which would be the blanket bog and would be the wet heat. And sorry, I was jumping the gun there. I should point out that this is Jakob's index. Um, on the left-hand side, you've got minus one to plus one. Plus one would indicate preference, a very strong preference. Minus one would indicate avoidance. So the habitats below the line here, these bars represent the habitats that the animals avoided, and the ones above the line represent habitats that were selected. So fairly consistently, uh, not, not, not strong avoidance or strong preference, but definitely a preference for dry heat and wet grassland and avoidance of wet heat and blanket bog, which is perhaps interesting because they would be more sensitive in terms of poaching and impact. Okay, so then we did some vegetation sampling to look at the impact of the grazing on the habitats. This was done in every, in each year. We had some areas that where the animals didn't have access, we call them exclosures, and then some, well, the rest of the reserve, the animals had access to, uh, and so a nice kind of paired design where we had quadrats. These are vegetation quadrats where you, you mark out an area and you measure various things in, in the, 
in the quadrat. So the species that are there, percentage cover of different species, the sward height, soil depth, all of these things. And then we can analyze those to look at um, change over time, but also uh, look at conservation status and how that changes. That was one of the things we looked at um, is the conservation status assessment. So mentioned earlier, these upland habitats are in across the country now this is are, are, aren't in good condition so one of the questions here was well if you're implementing cattle grazing can we assess those habitats uh, and see are they in good conservation status and are they improving or declining uh, at various levels of grazing so we take our gps data we can come up with with uh, levels of grazing low medium high and then we can assess the habitats in those areas uh, and look at whether the, the habitat is improving or not so this is just uh, I suppose some, some criteria that we look at when we're assessing habitat condition, the cover of different things, the cover of positive indicators, the cover of negative indicators, the cover of certain mosses. So we go in there and we do our two, about two meter quadrats and we can use those, and they're called monitoring stops, to look at how, how the habitat is in terms of its conservation status. Is it good, is it bad, is it improving or is it declining? This is under a, a thing called structures and functions in those Article 17 reports. So we do that for all the habitats. I'm sorry now about all the, you know, the, the tables with lots of detail. I suppose um, maybe just focus on, on the colours, if you like. So uh, the, these represent different plots. And this is just for wet heat. And we repeated this for plots in dry heat and blanket bog, etc. So plot one here is an exclosure. It had no grazing. So that we can, we can put a score on grazing level, zero being none because the animals are, are excluded. We do, to, we do our two by two metre quadrats. Some of them fail and some of them will pass. Um, so in 2013, there was two out of 15 fails. Um, and then there was no fails in 2014 and two out of 15 fails in 2015 and so on down the way. And generally the trend for wet heat was towards improvement. So going from sort of orange to green. There's a few down here on the bottom that historically had a, a lot of grazing. and you can see those five out of 14 fails, seven out of 14 fails, six out of 14 fails. Uh, sort of trending towards improvement on in those plots and these plots I, sh I should say by the way are 50 by 50 meters um, and some reasons here then for for why those plots failed um, but just pulling out some of the highlights I suppose northern Atlantic wet heat with Erica Tetralix was trending towards favorable conservation status over the period of the study at these stocking levels that's very site specific um, uh, dry heat was being maintained in favour of conservation status at these stocking levels at this site, uh, and blanket bog was, was being maintained in favour of conservation status. I haven't pulled out all of the tables um, from the results because it would be just too much detail to sort of look at, but um, those were, were the trends in the conservation status of the habitats with these cattle on this site, and as I said, it's very site-specific, and if we can make management as specific as possible, then it, 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 it makes for a better job. Um, and it, we, we do have to note here, actually, just down the bottom, that the site was in pretty good condition before we started. Um, and thanks to MPWS for allowing us to, to use the site uh, and to do some grazing and trials. Um, it, it perhaps might be a different story if you're starting with an area that was in very poor conservation status. Um, OK, so I think I'm nearly there now. And then we can have some questions and discussion. Uh, I hope doing OK for time. So just to summarise, in, in our study, at least, uh, wet grassland and blanket and dry heath were selected most. And again, this is a 460 hectare site and the animals had free access to the whole lot of it. Um, they tended to target the grassland and the dry heath and um, at least some avoidance of blanket bog and, and wet heath. The cattle appeared to reduce and target um, the cover of millennia, which uh, is perhaps a useful thing for conservation grazing in upland habitats. Um, there was no detectable increase in dwarf shrub over the course of this study. These heathlands recover very slowly over time or change slowly over time if grazing is, is kind of ex extensive rather than intensive. Um, so perhaps that's a reasonable finding. You wouldn't expect dwarf shrub to dramatically increase over a three, four year study. So hopefully we'll be going back. No detectable increase in species richness or diversity. Again, you wouldn't expect a lot of change in, in species richness or biodiversity measures over a short period, but at least we're, I suppose we were maintaining the status of these habitats. Yeah, and, and the trends in the conservation status of the of the Annex 1 habitats was towards favorable conservation status at these current stocking densities. I have a few details on, on the, the stocking rates uh, that I can I can talk about in a second if there's time. 
Um, so yeah, grazing, returning to cattle grazing may have a role to play, but certainly should consider um, habitat availability and distribution of habitat patches because as I mentioned, they don't, they don't graze evenly across a site. So, you know, it may need to consider where those patches of habitats are and where the animals are likely to target in order to best come up with conservation measures um, using grazing animals. So that's all I have for now, just to say thank you for listening and thanks to Pat and Catherine for the invite. I hope I got the timing okay. And no, it's welcome perfect. Any questions. Absolutely. So we have, we have a nice amount of time for questions. So if you had stop sharing there, we'll... Uh, and to remind people that uh, if you put your questions in the, in the, in the Q&A, uh, I might start. I mean, it's a, it's, it, it raises a whole pile of, of, of questions in my mind. Um, in, in terms of just the, the one of the pictures, I think I saw sheep in the background as well. So you, you were having sheep and, and cattle together, uh, do I take? Is that correct? Um, well spotted. And there were actually goats. Goats, sorry. Okay. Yeah, they were, um, there's a herd of feral goats in there and they have been in there, well, uh, probably as long as can be remembered. Um, I, there's around about 50 of them or so. So yeah, there was an underlying background of, of goats on the site. Um, uh, yeah, so it wasn't intentionally mixed grazing and there, there wasn't any sheep getting in there. It was just the, the, the background um, of, of the feral goats on site. And in terms of uh, the, the numbers of animals across uh, the, the, the area and the, yeah. the, the kind of the stocking rate, yeah. is there a, a view in relation to how that should be managed or is, is it more about having some there rather than matching, trying to match grazing uh, levels with, with, uh, with the amount of feed available? Yeah, um, so, so we had 30 animals or so in, and it was slightly up or down depending on the season and, and um, how many animals paddy had available and so around about 30 each season on a 462 hectare site was very low stocking rate but yeah. what was interesting is because the animals set up a very fixed kind of home range and there's different habitat patches in that home range we were able to look at uh, stocking rates based on those data so um, just say for, for wet heat what we had was a stocking rate once you kind of crunch the numbers a stocking rate of 0 0.17 livestock units per hectare based on um, the, you know, the, the number of animals and the proportion of habitats within their home range. Uh, and so that was, a, was at least seemed to be an appropriate stocking rate for the maintenance of wet heat at this site. Um, for, for dry heat, then it was 0 0.2, 0 0.2 livestock units per hectare was the, what it worked out as when we, we crunched the numbers. Blanket bog was 0.14 livestock units per hectare. Um, and, and these seem to be you know, roughly in line with the current recommendations for grazing on these habitats. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's where where we were at with it. And before I go to a completely different track, before I hand over the cat, cat yeah. Track, in terms of the economics of those animals, did did you do any work in terms of, uh, I suppose, how they worked out for the farmer involved? Yeah. Yeah, definitely an important consideration because it's a lot of work to get them up there and, you know, they're they're out on the mountain and where you have to kind of visit them every day and keep an eye on them. And uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of effort going into it. We did, there was a colleague of mine doing a master's by research at the time on um, the prevalence of nematodes in cattle in the uplands versus lowlands. And part of that, we were able to weigh all the animals before they went out on site and weigh them at the end. I think we did a weighing in the middle as well. Um, I think, I think the animals were putting on about a half a kilo per day over the course of the, the study while they were out there. Uh, and just anecdotally from Paddy, he was always very happy with them coming off the mountain. Um, you know, uh, and I don't come from a farming background myself, so some of the, you know, it, it was new to me. But yeah, he would, he would have been saying they were in good condition. There was one of the seasons, all right, they, we left them out a little bit longer, um, it kind of into October and they started losing condition just there wasn't the feed availability and we weren't supplementary feeding so so the following years and the, the grazing is currently going on actually it just might be finished but there's still a grazing agreement with the mpws he's taken them off the mountain i, I think in, in september early september because they just start to lose condition if they're out up there any longer okay that's a yeah. question starting to come in there yeah and some excellent questions and just following on there from what you were talking about leaving them out one good question there would it be considered to leave the animals out all year round or for a longer spell 
Um, well, it, it's probably local solutions are, are the key because it'll have to be, a, you know, with these conservation grazing prescriptions, it'll be about what works for the farmer in terms of the animal husbandry. Just speaking for the habitats, um, I would say, you know, June is about right to have the animals up there. Um, there isn't probably enough grazing available for them, or at least for the cattle, so May, June time. Um, and then, yeah, into October and beyond, it gets very wet. Uh, and so cattle, at least, they'll start to poach up the ground and have, um, you know, maybe negative consequences for, for those more sensitive habitats. So probably summer grazing regimes, although we see with the with the burn that is completely flipped, where it's a, a winterage scenario. Uh, again, that's very kind of site-specific for the burn. Yeah. Um, yeah, but but certainly I, I think from Paddy's perspective, he wouldn't like to see the animals out all year round because they lose condition. You'd have to supplementary feed. And once you supplementary feed, you're getting into the, you know, you're, you're focusing animals around certain areas, um, which is useful sometimes if you want them to, to, to maybe graze down certain things. But they'll, they'll have a, a, an impact on the more sensitive habitats if they're clustered into tight areas. Grand. And before I go, I go into, because we have lots of very specific questions and good questions, but from my own point of view, Killian, what's the plan? Is there anything going to continue now that your PhD work is finished? What? Yeah, they, well, on this site in particular, the, the grazing is continuing at these kind of stocking rates. I think this summer, Paddy has a few less cattle than he had in previous years. Um, in, they're sort of calving around January, February, and he likes to have them sort of going up there on the second week in July. So that's, sorry, just to cut short, the grazing agreement is still in place with the MPWS. I think there's two more seasons and then it'll be reassessed again. But I suppose, yeah, that's what I'm more, more interested in. Is, yeah. that, is that good work of assessment and the, the knowledge, which is amazing, yeah. which you have come up with, um, yeah. is going to be expanded or in any way, or yeah, well, at least continued? Yeah, uh, we hope so. Yeah, yeah we just great. need to maybe get another master students involved. And like for these for these conservation grazing programs, especially in the uplands, if it's extensive grazing, long term research is what's required. So yeah. my study was over three years. It'd be nice to repeat it in 10 years time, five years time, 10 years time, as they have done in Scotland, where they've got sort of 20, 30 years of research in this area. So Super. That's we do hope to continue it for sure. Yeah, well, that could be my feeling. Yeah. Now, just a f few specific ones, and we'll just try and move through them if you can. Sure. What, what do you think of Alan's savory and his holistic grazing ideas? I'm not aware of that. Are you? Um, not in in great detail. Um, as far as I know, that's this is holistic grazing and savory would have uh, promoted uh, mob grazing, taking the idea of large herds of grazing animals across you know the the african savannas they they target a certain area and then they move off and that area might not be revisited for long periods of time i, I think uh, yes a lot of series ideas were around taking that mob sort of idea and using it for for habitat conservation so packing the animals into to short areas over short periods of time and then they move on um but so you can have a place Yes, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. How did the GPS collars work? Um, I've seen similar things before, but the battery only lasted two days. <laughs> Hopefully you were able to get them a bit longer. Yes, yes. Um, the technology is improving all the time. They're, they're expensive enough. So these ones were about uh, 1,500 euros each and the battery is quite substantial. Wow. Um, so it suits large animals like cattle and elephants and whatever. Um, battery use is a problem. Um, yeah, especially for GPS because it's communicating all the time. So what we did was we we reduced the the frequency of detections to once every two hours. And with these particular collars, that was enough to last four or five months. Um, if you're if you're sampling at a higher frequency, then the battery obviously dies a little bit um, quicker. There's also no fence collars that are being used these days, where um, the 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 owner can. Uh, if you like sketch out an area on their smartphone or, or tablet that the animal um, is restricted to and then I think there's yeah they get a little uh, electric sort of pulse if they come near the boundary so um, here they were fenced in and there were standard batteries there's, there's other colors available as well it's, a, it's an, an area that's that's moving on isn't it uh, yeah. does any grazing approach help with invasive gorse or furs? 
Um, yes, certainly. Uh, again, on our side, we, that wasn't an issue for us, but I do know um, on the East Coast, on Hoth Head, they're using goats in particular to target gorse. Um, it's wildfire prevention, and you've got the added issue of Dublin Airport being uh, close by as well. So if there's wildfires on Hoth Head, it becomes a problem. So yeah, I know they're using goats on Hoth Head. Um, Hen Harrier Project is doing some trials with horses. So yeah, there's certainly a place for grazing animals to tackle those difficult species. So cattle will happily um, tackle a bit of bramble. Goats are happy to take on a bit of gorse, and it seems like uh, horses are as well. So depending on the species, it, it can be useful. Brilliant. Uh, were you happy with the two hours between the GPS fixes? Did you get a chance to study some of the actual behaviour, activity, association, solo wandering, individual preferences? Um, yeah, I, I mean, it, it might have been nice to inc increase the, the GPS fix um, frequency uh, and look at it every five minutes, um, and that would give you sort of finer resolution data. Uh, but, but as the previous uh, question was about batteries and issue. Um, I did spend some time doing direct observation studies where I spent uh, days at a time out with the animals, watching them. So we knew that where they were uh, from the GPS data and we were able to analyze that. But I also did some direct observation studies where you sit with the animals and you record behaviors over sort of 15 minute periods and you, you repeat that over the day and uh, replicated that in the lowlands. So we were able to tease out, and it's a bit more analysis that I have to do actually tease out, you know, what they were doing in each habitat type. So yes, they may have been targeting wet grassland uh, from the GPS data, but were they actually grazing when they were there or were they sitting around resting? So that's a, an extra bit of analysis that I have to do for some papers, hopefully, but uh, they're, they're not quite there yet. Uh, a couple of questions on deer. Have you any, um, or I suppose even the goats, the, has any attention or observations or records taken of deer grazing? Um, not on this study site. It's very far west. It's fenced off. I'm not sure there are deer out that way. Um, goats were on site, yes. Um, and there wasn't any sheep on site, although I should say that there was a few break-ins every now and again uh, with, with the sheep. So we have to, have to get them out. Okay. In relation to stocking rates, you mentioned uh, 0.17 livestock units per hectare um, on wet heat. Is this a year average? If concentrating on summer grazing, when say millennia is most palatable, would this equate to say in or around 0 0.6 to 0 0.7 for three months? So are we? To, are, are your stocking rates annual or summer, if you know what I mean? I think that's the question. And then the level for millennia. Yeah, that's um, it was and it's a good question. Uh, uh, did I have a point on it on my slide? But they, no, they were out. So they're only out on site for uh, the three, four months or so, four months. So um, your point one seven was for for the three, four months. Yes, exactly. Excellent. Not just to know what it is. Yes. So that would equate to yeah, if concentrating on summer grazing, uh, to to deal with millennia. Does that need to be higher, or do you, did you say that was okay? Um, well, we were able to see some reduction in in millennia um, in terms of abundance and cover, um, but over the period of time, it, it wasn't really reducing the you know the, the frequency or occurrence of millennia. So yeah, so that do... might need stronger. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's I think the point they were getting at. Yeah, um, yeah, uh, lots of comments about the the good presentation and the need for a lot more long term research. Uh, did the cattle graze late millennia, not the early green growth? Um, early. Oh, sorry. Um, late millennia. Yeah, they were they were on the millennia late into the season actually. And were they uh, still grazing that strong millennia, or did they stop once it went you know went over a bit? Um, no, they tend to graze it when it was quite strong. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, what adjustments would you make to monitoring or survey design if the study can be extended in the long term? So any recommendations for the future research and monitoring? Hmm. I, I'd have to, to think if, about with, that. With no limits, with no, no limits on budget or time, what uh, would you do? 
<laughs> yeah, well, with, with any ecological study, uh, you know, you're sort of limited by time and resources. Uh, what would be really nice, actually, is to find some additional sites that we could do some trials on. Um, so this was a site in West Kerry, state-owned, managed by the MWS in pretty good condition. It would be really nice to expand the study to different counties and to different upland regions. We have the technology, we have the um, you know the bit of know-how around how to analyse the data. So it would be nice to find some extra sites, do some trials with maybe some different species um, and, and different breeds, perhaps. Um, so if anyone, and, and one of the things with conservation grazing is that what's quite um, active in the UK is the practice of conservation grazing where um, particular breed owners, and it tends to be often the rare breeds, will be looking for sites for, uh, for to put their cattle out onto. And you have sort of these active conservation grazers which will move their animals around from site to site to do a bit of conservation grazing. Um, so that would be, it would be a nice area to see you know, see a bit of activity in Ireland where where um, farmers can, can move their animals to specific sites to carry out a job for a certain period of time and then they're back to the to, to the farm for the rest of the year. One last one for me, Pat, before I hand back to you. Um, about the again, the opportunities for organic farming and, you know, with the reducing stocking rate and, and payments that work, sorry, just opportunities for organic farming with the payment rates increasing. These upland systems are de facto organic, anyhow, and uh, with any tweaks, you know, probably very manageable. Or are they manageable? Or what's your opinion on organic farming? Or maybe, maybe you know, it's not your area, but you know what I mean. Just in general, on on organic on the uplands. Yeah, it's um, not particularly my area. As it happened, um, the farmer we worked with, Paddy Fenton, is an organic beef farmer, and the the person posing the question is is dead right these upland areas uh quite suitable tend to lend themselves to organic systems so definitely there's a, a very strong pace and for organic farming in these conservation grazing settings particularly if it can be um framed in a farming with nature kind of context and then it adds a, additional um value to the product so organic conservation grazing type b for or lamb or whatever is is kind of added value to to the farmer. It, it, it strikes me, Killian, that that's, uh, uh, and I, I actually had a question about the, the, the possibilities of using animals for short periods to rehabilitate and, and to, to help yeah. conserve areas. So you, you've kind of answered that as a as a as a possibility, a little bit like the the flying uh, 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 bees or the bees that move around in, in, in other countries. Uh, yeah. But I suppose one of the, the, the thoughts that, that I have is the complexity of the use of, of, of cattle to, to manage and improve uh, conservation and whether it's fair or practical to expect farmers to be in a position to monitor that or is there a, a requirement for, in essence, a professional service to allow far or to uh, uh, enable farmers to use uh, uh, cattle in this way? Yeah, um, I, I would say definitely there would be um, space for, yeah, professional advice and guidance for farmers so they can engage in these kind of uh, projects. What, you know, what has been encouraging is the, the EIPs over the years. Uh, I know in, in the weeks they've, uh, got some cattle involved to do a little bit of target grazing, hopefully to try and knock back some some bracken that, that uh, is, is bordering the habitat. Uh, so yeah, having locally led projects that can engage with the farmers that might have the animals or that might want to get back into cattle grazing um, that they may not have been involved in in recent years. So the projects provide the advice, sort of professional advice, engage with local um, services maybe like ourselves where we can go in and do some monitoring of the habitat before and after that sort of scenario so yeah that would be ideal where if you like the landowners and farmers can be guided uh, to use their animals for, for conservation purposes um, yeah and local projects are, are an ideal way to do that the barn and the leeks they're, they're good examples and harrier project and you talked uh, I suppose uh, 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 the the, the 
I think what you're discussing is almost a, a change in mindset from, I suppose, the traditional use of land to graze animals to produce output from to a use of animals to produce environmental benefits. And that's almost a complete turnaround in mindset for a, a farming community that the output is 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 the environmental piece uh, rather than a total focus on the the meat and uh, 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 that will be produced off the farm. Yes, yeah, very much so. That's where the conservation grazing kind of you know ethos comes from. It's it's about you know using working with farmers and their animals to try and produce um, public goods and services. In this case, biodiversity, maybe cap carbon capture, um, you know, improving water quality. Um, there's, there's definitely a place for the farming community to, to um, contribute to uh, biodiversity conservation uh, through their through activities. And you know, they should be supported to do that and encouraged to do that. And it adds value to the product then as well, if it's, if it's providing benefits for biodiversity. Um, but yes, it's it's very much coming from a sort of an outcomes based approach where where farmers are rewarded for for producing not just the product but also the environmental good, which in this case is the, the slightly better habitat or the improvement for biodiversity or the improvement for marsh fertility butterfly or whatever it may be. Yeah, very much coming from that way of thinking. Yeah, and I, and I suppose that the kind of publicity they're getting in Holt and Dalky at the moment can do no yeah. harm in terms of raising the, the awareness that, that that this is a a key possibility uh, for us in 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 the sector. Yes, yeah, it's certainly it's certainly great to see. Yeah. Okay, well, listen, I think uh, we we've answered most of the questions that are there. Unless there's any final question, Catherine. One final one there about uh, mineral deficiencies on millennia. Any 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 mineral deficiencies? While on the animal, no, you've no no experience or no reports. I no, I'd be chancing yeah. it if I started to get into that. I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's fine. That's fine. It's not a. It didn't raise its ugly head. If you know what I mean. So. Okay. Listen. Th thank you again, uh, Killian. Absolutely fascinating. A huge amount more work to be done on this. A huge amount of of more learning as to how to 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 make the transition that we're we're talking about and 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 to I suppose. Uh, 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 lead to improvements to a wide variety of of the different habitats that you talked about at the at the beginning of the the the, the presentation. So yeah. huge amount of more work here to do. I think compliments in terms of the work that you have done and and our encouragement uh, to 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 stay at it. So thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you very uh, much, and and thanks for the opportunity and the invite. It was a pleasure. So uh, with that, I'd say thanks to our production team of Andy Boland and Yvonne Maher in, in the background. And uh, we'll, we'll hope to see you uh, this time next week again. So thanks very much for joining us and goodbye. You've been listening to the podcast version of the Chagisk Signpost series, the weekly webinar that promotes and examines sustainability in Irish farming. Don't forget to join us live every Friday morning for our latest webinar. For more, visit chagas.ie. And you can also rate, review, and subscribe to the Signpost series on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts from. I'm Mark Gibson, and thanks for listening.